Hello and good afternoon everyone and welcome to the 8th session of the Reliance Foundation Youth Sports Athletics Development Webinar Series 2021. Thank you for attending this webinar today. We are all very excited to have you here with us today again at this webinar series brought to you by Reliance Foundation Youth Sports. RFIS aims to enable the ecosystem of sport through improvements in infrastructure, skill development of PE teachers, digital empowerment, and by creating sporting heroes. Reliance Foundation Youth Sports is a countrywide multi sport platform for school and college athletes. The platform was established to encourage a sporting culture in schools and colleges and to enable India's next champions. The content of these presentations are purely for educational purpose and should not be substituted for medical advice. If you have any questions during the presentation, you may please type it in, in the Q&A box and they will be responded to at the end of the session. Please make sure to follow our social media pages for more updates on the athletic web development webinar series and other RFIs related content. The series consists of 12 webinars covering athletic athlete developments aspects such as coaching, strength and conditioning, sport injury prevention and management, sports psychology and nutrition. As you already know, regular participants at this webinar will be awarded a certificate. Additionally, a few lucky ones will be invited to attend our advanced webinar series, which is coming up shortly. Today's topic, Strength Training Without a Gym, is being presented by the one and only Leandi Wanzeel. She is the strength and conditioning expert at Sir HN Reliance Foundation Hospital. And now over to you, Leandi. And a warm welcome. Thank you so much, Apoor. Um, it's really great to be here again today, guys, um, and welcome. So today's topic will be strength training without a gym. Um, as we've progressed in this series, I realize that a lot of you out there probably don't have a well-equipped gym to train out of. So that's why I think today's um, presentation is really important. All right, so just a... Uh, uh, overview of what we'll cover today. First, we'll look at some of the benefits associated with training with only your body weight. Then we'll discuss the components of a strength program, which I discussed in my previous webinar as well. Um, I'll briefly go through that and um, I'll kind of link it to our session today. Then we'll look at how to progress and regress a body weight program. There are some sample programs towards the end, which we'll discuss in detail. And then we'll just finish off with a summary of everything that we discussed. So if uh, we start off with the benefits of body weight training, uh, we can look at how it's multiple joint. What that means is with one exercise, you can train your whole body um, and you don't have to just separate certain specific muscles. So when we look at gym, gym training also, we think of it as just being bicep curls or tricep curls, and it's actually not that, <laughs> only that, but it's really important to realize that it's actually beneficial to do body weight exercises because you can use multiple muscles at the same time. Then if we look at um, strength, relative strength gains, if, if we're talking about, um, training in the gym, our focus or our goal is a little bit different towards when we're training with body weight. So for strength training, we always look at maximal strength um, and that's why you need external weight. Whereas if we're doing body weight exercises, we'll improve our relative strength, which is still good if you look at athletics, it's still good for running, it's still good for throwing, it's still good for jumping. So that's really important. Um, the next nice benefit that it has is that you, you engage your core a little bit more and you also have to stabilize your joints while you're working out. So that these are benefits that you don't always get when you're doing specific, general, traditional kind of gym exercises. Then it's accessible and versatile. You can do it anywhere, um, wherever you are, whether you're quarantined in your room, you can do it. Um, when you're out on the track, you can do it. You can do it on grass. Basically, anywhere you can do it. And you can adapt your program every time. It's not like, you oh, you need this specific equipment to do the exercises. You can adapt it according to your ability and according to your age, 
um, and according to the difficulty that you're at, that um, is acceptable for your body. Then um, the, the last one is probably the best one is that it's no cost. There's no gym membership. There's no paying for a personal trainer or strength and conditioning coach. So it's of no cost. Anyone can do it anywhere. All right, now how do we select our exercises? So a few of this will look very familiar to you guys who've seen my previous webinar. Um, but I will discuss them again because I think it's really important. This is, this is the foundation of any program. So if we look at the first one, we want to always make sure that we warm up. Even if it's just bodyweight exercises, you still want to make sure that you warm up properly. And that will include stability, mobility, activation, and we'll see potentiation as well. I'll discuss this a little bit later in detail. Then this is one that I've added because I think a lot of body weight programs involve a lot of jumping. So plyometrics is basically um, exerting maximal force in a short amount of time. And I think a lot of body weight programs always have um, jumps, some sort of squat jumps or lunge jumps, but it's really important that you do this um, appropriately and that you do it with the right technique. So that's why I added plyometrics in for today's session. Um, then we've spoken about squat, squat group before, we've spoken about split leg, hinge, push and pull, core, bracing, rotation, anti-rotation. And then also very importantly towards the end, we'll discuss cool down. So these are the, are the various aspects that should be in any program whether it's body weight or not, all right. Okay, so let's firstly discuss the warm up. I think it's also been discussed in previous um, webinars, but I will touch on it again because it's very, very important. So an easy way to remember what you do for your warm up is by remembering RAMP, so R-A-M-P. So firstly, we wanna raise the core temperature of the body, oops, sorry want to raise the core temperature of the body, we want to increase the heart rate. So maybe, for example, running around the track a few times slowly, just getting your heart rate up, getting your blood pumping. All right, activation is when we, for a specific session, we need to activate specific muscles. Um, so let's say, for example, you're going to be doing a sprint session. So you need to make sure that you're just really activating your glutes, activating your hamstrings so that you're ready for a sprint session. Then if we look at mobilization, so what's mobility? So our joints have different, um, different functions that they perform. Some joints are for stability, some joints are for mobility. So if we, if we talk about mobilization, we, we want to let a joint move freely um, without any restrictions. So for that, it is important to do ankle mobility because the ankle is a mobile joint. Hip mobility, the hip is also a mobile joint. Thoracic mobility, which is this kind of area, and then our shoulder mobility. So these are the, are the usual mobility exercises we add in our warm-ups and it just really gets your body in the best position to perform when you're doing your session. All right, whether it's body weight, whether it's strength training, whether it's on the track, this is really important. And then next up, we have our performance or potentiation. Basically, this is exercises that will help you perform in the session that you're going to do. And it's similar to the session that you're gonna do. So for example, if you're gonna be, again, doing a speed session, you would wanna put out the cones and you're just gonna stride over the cones um, as a potentiation or performance exercise towards the end of your warm-up. Okay, so next we'll discuss our plyometrics, okay, or power. So what's really important about plyometrics is that you want to be able to do it with good technique. I know a lot of coaches out there are working with younger athletes, and it's important to teach the proper way to jump from a young age. So uh, a nice rule of thumb that I always um, teach my athletes that I work with is when they land, 
So I want to keep the shoulder in line with the knee. So that's called a power position. So when you're when you're kind of in a hunched semi squat position, that's called a power position. And you always want your athletes to be landing in that position so that the force distributes throughout their lower body. Um, it's very taxing for the neuromuscular system. We'll, we'll uh, see later on that there's different plyometrics and they, they affect the body differently, but it's still sometimes important if you do plyometrics to do it in the beginning of the session so that the athletes are fresh. Um, this will depend on your session as well, but if you can, make sure that you do it in the beginning of the session. Um, quantity versus quality. So this is also a really important one. Again, technique is very important. You guys have heard me say this multiple times, but especially with plyometrics, it is very important that you focus on the quality of the movement instead of doing hundreds and hundreds of jumps. Again, this will depend on what kind of plyometrics you're doing. Some are low impact, some are high impact. We'll discuss this in the next slide. Um, okay, this I've said, and then you wanna be sure that you're always wearing shoes if you're jumping on a hard surface. If you're jumping on a soft surface like a track or grass or sand or, um, or maybe this, this synthetic track, then that's all right. Um, you don't really need to wear shoes for that. But if you're doing a workout in your room, and for example, your room has tiles, it's really important that you make sure that you wear shoes because it does, um, if you jump, there's a lot of impact on your joints and you don't wanna get injured by doing some jumps. All right. And then the last one, uh, you see a lot of uh, athletes jump with their knees pushed together. I think this is, this is easily correctable if you just keep reminding them and also if you work on their, their, um, the rest of their muscles to make sure they're strong enough to jump. Um, so just make sure that your knees stay straight in line with your hip and your toe. All right, I'll just play the video here. So nice up and he's landing nice shoulder knee in line. All right. So if we wanna look at progressions, because this is also really important, I think um, for younger athletes, we wanna work on movement and coordination. This is low impact plyometrics, and we wanna make sure that they focus on their technique. Um, so once, and this is for example, say skipping. So skipping, um, we'll look at the examples in detail. Um, skipping or just playing, um, really just getting the basic of the movements right. Um, then, once athletes are confident in the movement and coordination, they can move to, on to focus on the landing and force absorption. Now here, again, the technique is really important. So we want them to land in that power position. A few um, examples here is squat jumps, box jumps, broad jumps, um, and then we can move on towards plyometric strength. So this is now becoming a little bit more specific to the kind of athlete that you have. So for example, you have a, you have a sprinter, then you wanna do more of kind of lunge jumps with quick foot contacts. Um, and these exercises will have higher impact on the body. So now we have to remember quality above quantity. So make sure that you don't do millions and millions of these in one session, spread it out maybe over the week, uh, make sure that you increase one week to the next week with 10%, um, that's really important. Again, here, other examples are hurdle jumps or continuous jumps. Um, and then we move on to the more, for the more elite athletes, you want to, oh, excuse me, plyometrics, um, plyometric power is, for example, bounds. Again, for the more elite athletes, you want to make sure that they, they have quick foot contact. And it's very, very similar to the kind of um, exercise there or the kind of sport they're playing. All right. So just to give you guys an example. So our, our first one would be stiffness jump. So if we're looking at movement and coordinations, nice straight legs, toes up, just working on those stiffness jumps. 
keeping the joints nice and stiff. Next, we'll look at box jumps. Here, a little bit more specific. You wanna make sure you land in that power position. Then we'll do lunge jump nice and quick. So this is a sprinter. So he's, he's just really working on moving those legs, recycling those legs really quickly. And then we have our bounds, which is more elite for the elite athletes, nice quick movements. All right, so that's it for biometrics. So I'll briefly just go through the others as well. I know I spoke about it a lot, but if we're looking at body weight exercises, we have our body weight squat. Again, making sure um, knee, foot, uh, hip in line and go as deep as you can. And we'll discuss later how to progress this. Next one would be our split leg, for example, a lunge. So this is a nice dynamic lunge. Stepping out, lunging, again, foot, knee, hip in line. Just making sure you're going, you're keeping your upper back nice and straight. All right, for our hinge, which is our hip dominant movement. Again, just making sure you're pulling with your lat muscles really nice and up. We have our push ups going all the way down, making sure your, your um, spine is nice and straight. And then we have our plank or our brace exercise. Again, making sure the body is nice and straight, activating the core. And keeping your feet in line with your elbow and your hip. All right. So, oh yeah, and the last one is the rotation and anti-rotation. So this is just a plank with a rotation. Always making sure that we're not just training the six pack muscles, that we're training the whole um, area that affects um, the core. All right, and then our last one is the cool down. Again, very important. I know athletes like to skip this one because um, they feel it's a waste of time, but really it's, it's quite important. Make sure that you static stretch. If you have a foam roller, great. If you don't, static stretching is more than enough. Remember static stretching, you wanna hold your leg in position for at least 20 to 30 seconds. And you wanna repeat it at least two to three times. Um, make sure that you don't do static stretching before a workout because there's been some research done and it's not always ideal. Instead, do dynamic stretches before a workout and static stretches after a workout. All right, so now how do we progress our program if we, if we are doing a bodyweight program? Because we know that in the gym, we would just simply add weight, add weight, add weight. But now it's a little bit more challenging to progress your bodyweight exercise. So quickly, just a quick description of progression and regression. Regression is a decrease in the difficulty of exercise. Progression is the increase in the difficulty of exercise. So when we start with younger athletes, we wanna make sure that we use the most regressed form of the exercise to teach the movement. Um, so for example, if you're doing a push-up, make sure that they do it on the wall first, and then you progress towards the floor so that you make sure they have the adequate strength to do the, the exercise properly. Okay, so we have seven ways that we can progress body weight exercises. So firstly, if we talk about the movement of resistance or leverage factors, so we know that if we change the angle of an exercise, it can increase or decrease the difficulty of an exercise. I'll, uh, I'll discuss it a little bit more with examples in the next slides. Then quickly, the range of motion of an exercise. The more range of motion an exercise has, the more difficult it becomes. So for example, putting your hands on something while doing a push-up, 
makes it more difficult than just doing it on the ground. Then if we look at plane of movement, so there's different planes in the body. So if we change an exercise plane, then the exercise becomes, works different muscles and it will be a different challenge for the body. We, we know that say, for example, sprinting happens only in one plane, but we wanna make sure that even with younger athletes, we train them in different planes of movement so that they're overall well-developed. Next one would be stability demands. Um, any bodyweight exercise can be challenged by adding instability. Um, and then there will also be, have to be more core activation during the stability, during the unstable, un instability of the exercise. So this is also a really good way to kind of adapt the body weight program. Then we can add small uh, soft resistances. What do we mean with soft resistances? It might be a medicine ball. It might be some form of elastic super band or a loop band that you can use. And then you can also maybe make your own weights with a backpack with books in it or a water bottle, for example, just a heavy uh, one liter water bottle. You can do some exercises with that. So there's always ways that you can progress your exercises if you need to. Um, then just doing single limb or, or arm variations. So maybe you're doing a, a push up again and then progressing towards a one hand push up. I know it's a very daunting task, but again, that's a good progression. And then tempo. So what we, what we mean with tempo is we mean the, so an exercise can, can happen slowly, it can happen fast. Some part can be slow, some part can be fast. So if you play around with that also, it can really increase uh, the difficulty of the exercise. All right, so we'll just look at each of them uh, individually. So moment of resistance, again, so if we wanna change the angle of the exercise, it'll become more difficult or easier. So for example, if she puts her legs on the bench here, it'll be a lot more difficult than it is right now. Um, and also then you can even move the bar up and change that angle for her as well. So that is what we mean with the moment of resistance. So the next one is the range of movement. So what we wanna be sure of here is that we're increasing the height of the body so that you have to go into exercises a little bit lower um, than you would have if you were just on the ground. So using maybe a medicine ball, using some blocks, with your hands on it, uh, that will be really effective. All right, then the plane of movement. So this is a this is a lateral lunge. So again, if we're doing a forward lunge, this will now change the plane in which we're moving. So again, challenging in different ways, uh, putting pressure on different muscles. All right, stability demands. So instead of just doing a simple plank, he's doing a plank to push up. So his body has to really focus on just staying nice and stable and activate the course of the hips to move. Okay, and then here we're just, here this is actually an example of tempo as well because they're holding the squat in place and then they're using a light soft resistance to do a row with. So again, engaging multiple muscles at the same time And then if we look at single arm or leg variation, probably the single leg squat would be the most obvious one, also very difficult to perform. And again, make sure uh, ankle, knee, hip, nice in line. And ideally we would want him to go further down in his range of motion. And then tempo. So this is again our lunge. He's holding it at the bottom, coming slowly up. Holding it and slow, yeah. So you can go and try these at home. I think I think you'll see that it's there's a big difference between all of them. Leandy, uh, yes. sorry. 
Yes. So there's a um, there's a participant who'll like you to explain plane of movement once again if you, if it's possible. Sure. Yes. Sorry, let me just go back here. All right. So plane plane of movement basically means if we're we have different planes. We have a frontal plane, we have a sagittal plane, and we have um, I forgot the other plane. Um, so there's three planes of motion of movement basically. And say, for example, if we're running, we're moving in one plane. Now, if, if I'm doing a lunge, I'm just doing it in one plane. So now we want to change the plane of movement to make it more challenging for the athlete. So, for example, we're moving to the sagittal plane by doing a lateral lunge. Um, so the sagittal plane basically divides our body into left and right. So we're moving towards the side which is challenging for our body then in that, in that plane, in a different plane. Whereas if we're just doing things in one plane, our body gets very used to it and those specific muscles gets very, get very strong. But if we want to move into another plane, now you can see he, his adductors, which is the inner thigh muscles, they're working really hard to stabilize him on the side. And it's not just your, your, your anterior muscles or the quads that's working, we're also working the adductor muscles. Okay, and of course the glutes as well. So I hope that answers your question. Maybe if you, um, if at the end, if you still don't understand, then maybe I can spend a little bit more time during the question or to, to explain that. Thank you, Andy. No worries. Uh, where was I now? Okay. Tempo. All right. So we we spoke um, in detail about how to progress certain exercises, but you can actually also um, progress your entire program. So what's important is yes, exercise progressions are there, but again, your entire program can also be made more difficult. So how do we do that? So we have frequency, volume. And intensity. So if we're increasing our frequency, frequency basically means it's the, the amount of sessions you do in a week or the amount of sessions you do in a month. So by increasing the number of sessions you do per week, say for example you're doing two sessions per week, now you increase it to three, that will already increase your difficulty of the entire session. Then if we look at volume, so volume is our sets, our reps, multiply our loads. So don't worry about the load too much, but basically it's our sets and reps. We can always increase our reps and we can always increase our sets and that will make it more difficult to do the same program. And then we can increase the intensity. Now, I think it's important to note here that intensity, we usually increase by changing timings. So maybe not just doing an exercise for 10 reps, but maybe doing it for 30 seconds with limited amount of rest and then doing the next exercise for 30 seconds. So we've all done these high intensity interval training type workouts. So this is, this is one way of increasing the intensity. However, I want to note here that you have to be a little bit more advanced to do those kind of workouts Otherwise, your technique will really be bad in most of the exercises because you're rushing to do as many repetitions as you can. So make sure you know the technique first before going into these circuit type, timing-based kind of programs. Um, and I would not always suggest it for younger athletes unless they've trained for a bit and know the technique of the exercises properly. All right, so uh, Tabata basically just means 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off. Um, you usually do eight exercises, but you can do more. Um, you can increase the time to 30 seconds, increase the time to 40 seconds if you want to. But basically, high intensity, doing all your exercises within the, or doing one exercise for 20 seconds, resting for 10 seconds, and then moving on towards the next. Again, you can do about two or three sets of these, and you'll be pretty tired towards the end of it. So, an EMOM is basically every minute on the minute, which means 
you set specific repetitions for um, exercise. You have to finish that in one minute, and then the next minute uh, will start, um, and you have to start with a new exercise. So that's what every minute on the minute is, and then a pyramid, <laughs> pyramid is probably the most difficult one, which is one exercise. Again, guys, please, if you're elite and you're looking for a change up in your program, this is perfect. But for younger guys, please don't do this if you're not competent in your movements. Okay, so a permit is you do one exercise and then you rest for a set period of time, maybe one minute. Then you do another exercise for one minute um, and you do back-to-back -back exercises. So one minute, one minute, and then you rest for a minute. And then it builds up. So exercise one, exercise two, exercise three, rest for a minute, one, two, three, four, and so on and so forth. So again, it's, it's, I just basically put it on here for anyone looking to do something different with their body weight training. Um, this is quite effective to increase your intensity, but make sure that you can do all the movements properly. All right. So just some sample programs that I've put up here. Um, I want you guys to understand how I got to these programs, okay? So firstly, we're gonna see which component we're addressing. Then we're gonna see the exercise, what kind of sets and reps we have, the primary body part that it works, but also the secondary body part that it works. So again, we wanna do exercises that addresses more than one muscle group at a time. That's very important. Okay, so like I said, plyometrics we usually do um, in the beginning of a, of a workout. Uh, I put here squat jumps, Again, look at that. We're just doing five repetitions and we're doing three sets and we're trying to rest completely in between the sets because, again, it's really taxing on the neuromuscular system and you want to make sure you do it properly. The primary body part is we're going to train our legs, but core is also involved and you can argue, argue that you're also training your upper body. All right, then I just put us for a squat group. We're going to do overhead squats. So nice overhead squats. Um, doesn't have to be with the bar. You can do it with an elastic in your hand or a string in your hand or a stick in your hand, basically anything. And uh, again, just basically three times 10. Again, primarily should be legs, but there's definitely some shoulder stability in there as well. Then the next one is our hinge pattern. So here we are gonna do a hip thrust on the bench, three times 10. Should be legs, but there's also a lot of core involved. Okay, a push group, we're gonna do a push up with one leg. So see here, I'm challenging the stability of the exercise, three times 10, it's upper body, but also it's core. And you can also argue that it's leg because one leg has to stabilize when it's up. Pull, pull ups. Three times eight. Again, if you're a beginner with pull-ups, maybe regress it. Uh, make sure that you do the horizontal rows first before you go on to pull-ups, because it is quite a difficult exercise. And then we're doing upper body, and it's also addressing your core. Okay. Last one would be reverse plank with a leg lift. All right. So now we're again just challenging the stability with the core. Uh, we're doing three times ten. 10 per side, it's mainly for core, but you're also gonna feel some shoulder stability and you also feel your hamstring that's working to stabilize your body at that point. Okay, and then just a little bit more advanced program. Uh, so our plyometrics, we're gonna do hops. So hops is basically single leg jumps. Um, again, you have to make sure that you build up to it and not just, don't just go and hop around, you have to make sure that you build up to it and your body is ready for it. And again, look at the low reps. We wanna make sure that we rest in between and make sure that we do five hops well. And primarily legs, but also core. Um, a squat would be single leg squats, challenging stability again, three times 10, it's legs and core. Our hinge pattern would be a single leg RDL, um, oh, this is a Romanian deadlift. 
So we're challenging stability, we're also challenging planar movement, three times 10, legs and core, a push. Uh, so here we have our archer push up. Again, a little bit of change of plane instead of just our straight push up, uh, three times 10, upper body and core. Uh, we have our slow pull ups. Again, a little bit more challenging with challenging the tempo of the pull ups. Three times eight, upper body and core. And then our brace or our core exercise would be a side plank with a leg lift. So again, we're just adding some instability to a basic exercise to make it more challenging. And that will challenge your core and your legs. All right, so our key takeaways for today, especially is that you do not need a gym to do strength training. I know a lot of you guys out there feel that, you know, the only way to get stronger is by going to a gym. That is not true. I showed you guys lots of exercises that you can do without any equipment and without um, having a gym. And then I'll, I'll re-emphasize all of our um, components of a strength program, plyometrics, push, pull, squat, split leg, hinge, brace, plank, rotation, anti-rotation. Also remember your warm-ups and your cool downs, very important for any type of training you're gonna do. And then we have our progressions and regressions um, that we spoke about. And you have to make sure that you do that according to your ability. Um, and if you're younger athletes, please start with the basics first and then build yourself up. All right, um, that is it from my side. Um, Thank you, Yandy. Ready for the questions now. All right, before we move into the question and answers, I would like to remind all our participants that the regular participants of our athletics webinar on development series will be getting a certificate and also a chance to be invited to an all exclusive elite webinar series that will be hosted by RFIS and RF uh, Reliance Foundation uh, Athletics or so High Performance Center. So please uh, make sure you tune in week in, week out. We are here every Friday, 4 p.m for four more sessions and thank you to all the participants who joined in today. Now we will begin our Q&A session um, with Leandy. So Leandy, um, the first question uh, of it is, um, is it a myth that younger adults can only do certain type of exercising exercises to minimize uh, impacting their growth? For example, I have heard people saying kids should not lift weights uh, even if they are two kilo dumbbells. <laughs> this is a, a very, very important question. Um, unfortunately, and fortunately, there's no exercise that can change your height, make you shorter or make you taller. So please, that is a big, big myth. I addressed it in my previous presentation as well. Um, the, the important part about tra training younger kids is that you have to make sure that their technique is proper. If they're doing a goblet squat with a two kg dumbbell, but they have good technique, then there's nothing wrong with that. But there's a process for, for that. So you don't just start a nine year old off with here's a two kg dumbbell. You start them off with body weight, make sure they can squat properly, they have mobility in their hips, and then they can progress towards a two kg dumbbell. It's not going to affect their growth at all. It's not going to stunt their growth at all. So um, that is definitely a mess. And there, honestly, if you progress any exercise well, then athletes can definitely lift with any weight. Again, just start slow. Don't start with the 5 kg dumbbell. Start with the 2 kg dumbbell. Um, that's really important. So unfortunately, there's, that's, a, that's a big myth. But yeah, you can't change your height with any, any exercise. Thank you for that, Leandy. Um, uh, the other question is from Om Prakash. He says, uh, what is the difference between power and strength training? Can they be paired together in the same workout or should they be uh, done separately? Good question. Um, power and strength. So strength is when we're lifting the maximum amount of weight. And power is we're moving as fast as we can with an exercise. Um, so power can, 
for, for strength training, um, if we're looking at strength and conditioning, power can either be plyometrics. Plyometrics is also power. Let's talk about jumps. Um, or it can be maybe Olympic lifting movements. Now, again, please don't go do Olympic lifting movements if you do not know how to. Um, but definitely, we call it complex training, where we can put uh, power with strength training. And so one, one nice, heavy strength exercise with one, say, jumping exercise that stimulates the same muscles. And that has been shown to make um, athletes stronger, faster. So definitely, we can do that. Um, however, if you're younger and you're inexperienced, start with separating them. Start with doing strength training, or maybe do the power before you do the strength. So do your plyometrics in the beginning of your session and then do your strength training. Um, and then later on, you can maybe pair the two to get more effective um, results with your, with your strength program. Thank you, Leandi. Uh, the second or uh, the third question actually is from Joadit. He's asking you uh, in order to monitor and improvise, uh, improve the stamina, um, is a beep test or endurance test recommended for a 12 year old? Um, okay. I think if the, if the athlete has trained for a while and if you need baseline metrics, then maybe you can do a bleep test with the 12 year old. Um, but it's quite important to see what kind of level they're at. If they, for example, never run any endurance or done any endurance in their life, doing a bleep test will absolutely kill them. <laughs> so I think it's quite important to see where the athletes at. If they've been training and they've been doing some conditioning exercise, then yes, for sure, you can test them. Um, maybe, maybe do a modified test where you only do up to a certain level um, to make sure that you don't uh, completely exhaust them, make sure you warm up, make sure you cool down. Um, but definitely if it's a, if it's a, a athlete who's been training and who's playing some sort of an endurance sport, then definitely you can test them. But just be wary that if, if they're not used to it, it might be quite tough for them. Thank you, Leandi. Um, we have a lot of football coaches here with us today. And one of the questions is, how relevant is strength and conditioning when it comes to the sport of football? OK. Um, again, really good questions. Um, the thing about strength and conditioning is it has two goals. The first goal is to improve your performance. The second goal is it's to prevent or to reduce the incidence of injuries. So for any sport, those are the two main goals. So definitely for football, if we make robust, strong athletes, they'll be able to run faster on the pitch. They'll be able to score more goals. They'll be able to sustain the whole um, length of the game. So then for sure, it's definitely beneficial. And if they're, if they're stronger, they also, also, I mean, football is a, is a difficult sport because they do contact each other in some way or another. Um, but you can still reduce the uh, incidence of overuse injuries, such as, um, you know, maybe knee pain or anything like that. So for those two main reasons, I would suggest strength training for any and all sports because it will help you with those two, um, two things. Thank you, Leandi. Uh, the next question is from Saurav Bhaskar. He's asking, can bridging and hip, hip thrusts be used interchangeably? And, uh, sorry, or are they very different and one can't replace the other? Um, I guess it depends on your, um, your definition of a bridge and a hip thrust. So for me, I speak about a hip thrust a bridge as being on the ground. It's basically a hip thrust you do on the ground. And then a hip thrust is more advanced than your, your upper back is on a chair or something like that. So um, definitely they're, they're working the same muscles. It's a hip hinge exercise. 
So it's for your glutes, it's for your hamstrings. So it's definitely the same movement. We just progress it by doing a hip thrust and putting someone, someone's back on, uh, again, changing that range of motion that we're talking about. So we're putting them higher up. So the hips need to be dipped down lower to um, work harder to get up. So definitely the same thing. Um, probably just different names for it. And yeah, so my, for me, hip thrust is upper back on a bench, um, whereas a bridge is just the same movement on the ground. Thank you, Leandi. Uh, the next question is, um, uh, what unilateral or bilateral uh, exercises would you recommend for better leg strength? Um, I think it's always better to start with bilateral exercises and teach the movement. So again, our squat, um, single leg, split leg would be our lunges. Um, and then probably this is for our squat pattern, uh, progressing towards single leg squats, um, Bulgarian split squats, um, can even do reverse lunges, change, change the, change the movement of the exercise as well. If we're looking at hip exercises, so hinge exercises, hip dominant, we wanna do hip thrust, we wanna do deadlift. Again, make sure you know the technique of a deadlift before you do that. And then you can do sing, you can do Romanian deadlifts uh, where your legs are straight and you can do single leg Romanian deadlifts. You can do single leg deadlift also, um, single leg hip thrust as well you can do Good mornings, a single leg good mornings. Um, I wish I could show you guys all these exercises, um, but those are pretty much uh, most of the ones I use in my programs. Uh, I'm sure there's multiple, multiple more, but if you wanna start off, start off with your bilateral exercises and a move towards your single leg type, progress it towards your single leg exercise. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, when you perform some exercises, is it advised to do them or start off uh, slowly or does it only apply to ramp during warm up? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question fully. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it and uh, please make a note in the chat box if, I, if you don't understand. Um, so for our ramp protocol that we do for a warm up, you want to increase the intensity of the exercise. So we start with a slow jog and then you increase the intensity towards the end. It's high intensity. Right. So we want to kind of progress it um, in that way. Now, if you're talking about exercises, um, the slower you do an exercise, the more you can focus on doing the exercise properly. So I would always suggest doing an exercise slow and controlled um, until you know exactly what the movement is and you know exactly how to perform the movement. And then you can move on towards your more high intensity training where you're, you're just doing the exercise for 30 seconds, nice and fast, but you wanna do as many repetitions as you can. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. It's, it's a bit too, too different, different answers, but I think, I hope that answers your question. Please uh, just uh, mention the question answer if, I, if, if that's not what you asked. All right, uh, I, think, I think that more or less, I, I, I get that you answered the question. Uh, going ahead, uh, another, qu another participant asked the question, is strength and con are strength and conditioning exercises a good way to gain weight if you're uh, underweight or should and what kind of uh, nutrition should it be supplemented with? Um, yes, definitely. If you want to do strength training uh, to increase your weight, you can definitely do that. Um, I would suggest then doing a little bit more reps, not just 10, maybe 12 to 15 repetitions. Uh, increase the repetitions, maybe increase your sets to say four um, if you want, if you need to increase your weight. Um, from a nutrition perspective, um, making sure you have enough protein. Um, a lot of athletes in India are vegetarians and they don't always get enough protein in. 
to make sure that with every meal you have your carbs and your protein, especially if you need to gain weight. Um, and then supplementing that with your, with your strength program would be really helpful. Um, again, I'm not a nutritionist, but this is my advice. Make sure that you have enough protein um, with carbohydrates because that's how we build muscles. Um, and also make sure that you have enough water then if you're having more protein. And yes, then doing more reps and more sets would be beneficial for someone like that. I think one of the most frequent questions, Andy, in the uh, Q&A box is how many, I, I, and I think there might be no one right answer, but how many uh, times a week should one engage in strength and conditioning session? Yes, that's, that's a very important question. Um, I think probably for body weight, um, specific to my presentation, um, it really depends on the athlete. Uh, body weight exercise probably won't be as exhausting as doing weight training in the gym so or strength training in the gym. So maybe just having 24 hours of rest in between sessions is enough. However, it might depend on your intensity as well. So if your intensity is quite high, it might take 48 hours to recover. So then you would want to do, say, three sessions a week instead of maybe four. Um, I guess it's really important just to think about your athlete and say, okay, um, what's my athlete's total load over the whole week? Um, for example, our, our sprinters do, they, they currently, they're in competition season, so they do three heavy, heavy uh, sprint sessions in the week, and we're doing four strength training sessions so we kind of speak to the coach and collaborate on that. But if you're seeing that your, your athlete is recovering properly and they're kind of ready the next day, then you can maybe do four sessions a week. Uh, for a beginner, again, start with two, progress it to maybe three. Uh, again, depending on your season, depending on how much time you have, um, it will really depend. I guess I'm not answering anyone's questions, but start with two. And then you can progress to three. And if you see that you're still fine with body weight exercises, then maybe you can progress to four. Um, the minimum would be two. And I think probably maximum, depending on what level you're at, would be four. Okay, thank you, Andy. Uh, the second question, uh, or the, uh, the next question is, uh, is agility hampered in any way if you increase your muscle mass um, by doing strength and conditioning training? Um, no, definitely not. Um, I think, I think we, we need to, it's, it's a very important question. You need to make sure that we understand hypertrophy and we need to understand strength. So hypertrophy is when we're increasing the cross-sectional area of the muscles. So basically getting bigger muscles. All right. Strength, we're basically getting the current muscle mass that you have as strong as possible. Or like I said, lifting, you know, maximum weight in um, for a set amount of reps, okay? So the two is very different and how you train for it is very different. If we're gonna be increasing our muscle mass, then definitely, if, if that's our goal, we wanna increase our muscle mass, then, and it's hypertrophy, then it might hamper our agility. Because it's not gonna, it's gonna be muscles that's not as functional as it would be with strength. So our goal with the strength program would be to make you faster on the pitch. So you're not gonna increase that much cross-sectional area. You might, but it will be effective muscles that will help you run faster or be more agile. Whereas hypertrophy, which is bodybuilding that kind of exercises, bicep curls. Um, you know, tricep, separate muscles at the same time or separate muscles, um, training basically separate muscles with more repetitions and more sets will make you bigger and probably not as efficient as we would want. Whereas if we're working on pure strength, we want to make you faster. That's our main goal. 
We only do strength training for two things, performance enhancement, as well as injury prevention. So if we're, again, now, if we're working on strength, we're gonna do maybe two or three sets and we're gonna do maybe four sets and we're gonna do less repetitions with heavier weight. And it will be exercises that, stim that will stimulate multi-joint movements basically say a front squat or a back squat or a deadlift, something like that, where multiple muscles are worked at the same time and it will make you better on the pitch. That's the main goal of strength training. If it's not making you better on the pitch, we won't do it. So just remember that there's a big difference between hypertrophy, which is increased in the muscle size. That's your main goal. But strength training is we want to make you a better athlete. I hope that's clear. I think I think so. Thank you, Gandhi. Um, the next question, and again, one of the most frequently asked questions here is: During puberty, do you uh, recommend free weight exercises or body weight exercises? And does it affect in any way your growth? Again, um, you I think answered that, but uh, just what you think is ideal for someone hitting puberty? Yeah. So what happens when um, athletes hit puberty? and I think my colleague Mihira also spoke about this a few weeks ago, is that basically your, your bones are growing and your muscles are just kind of, you know, catching up. So it might feel and look like an athlete is a little bit more, uh, how do you say, uncoordinated, but doing, if you have been doing a specific set of exercises and you can see that their movement has changed now, what you can do is just regress those exercises again. So say, for example, they can't squat now as deep as they used to before puberty, then maybe just take them back, start again with a, maybe a body weight squat or overhead squat or lighter weights to make sure that they still work in, the, in a specific range of motion. Because what will happen is the body just becomes uncoordinated, but it, it is still able to move. So we need to make sure that even during those phases when, they're, uh, when they hit puberty, we just make sure that they're still moving well and the technique is good. And maybe we just uh, pull back the weight a little bit to make sure that they're, they, they don't really, they don't move in a bad position. Because moving in a bad position might, you know, just cause some sort of injury, but you as a coach or you as a strength coach um, has to make sure that whatever exercises they do need to be safe for them and they need to have the right technique. So it won't injure them, but maybe just drop the weights a little bit or if they're doing body weight exercises, they can continue doing body weight exercises, but make sure that technique is proper. Thank you, Liandi. And going with the last question, uh, we have, uh, what, what what is the ideal interval you reckon between two sets? And uh, should the number of sets or reps be modified with your competition time coming? Um, I'm thinking this is for specific for body weight exercises. Um, I think for body weight exercises, probably it depends on your level. I know I said this a lot, but if you're, if you're quite advanced and you've been doing bodyweight exercises for a while, then maybe you don't have to rest that much in between, um, in between exercises and in between sets. Um, you definitely would change how your program is before a competition. Maybe you would not do as many sessions. We call it, usually we call it a deload in athletics. Um, or in strength and conditioning, we call it a deload. So the week before maybe a major competition, we would drop down towards, if we were doing three sets, maybe we drop down to two. If we were doing four sessions, maybe we drop down to three sessions. It all really depends on your athlete and what your goal is and when they're participating. So definitely um, the intensity would be lower when, or the volume, we call it the volume. So the sets, reps, um, the sets multiply, reps multiply um, load would definitely be, we would want it to be lower before we hit the competition. Now that can be one week before or two weeks before, it really depends. 
uh, but we'll, we'll uh, deload them before competition so they're nice and fresh and ready and not sit and sore uh, for their competition. Um, but in, in a body weight um, session, I guess it will really depend on you. If you're quite advanced and you can even do the high intensity um, interval training with 10 seconds rest in between each exercise and maybe three minutes rest in between each set. And you can keep adapting that according to your level if it becomes too easy or it becomes too hard and you can again adapt, adapt it back. Um, so that really depends on your level and what you've been doing currently. Thank you so much, Leandi, uh, for hosting such a wonderful and informative session. And I think you very rightly answered most of the questions. And um, it's an honor hosting this session for you. Again, uh, I'd like to hand you back on uh, this platform if you have some parting words for the attendees. Yes, I think uh, since we have a lot of football coaches on, <laughs> I think it's really important to understand that um, you want as strength and conditioning coaches, we want to try and make athletes better for their performance and their injury prevention. Now, whether you do that with body weight exercises or in a gym, always make sure that your technique is proper and make sure that you, you don't do exercises that you don't know the technique of. Um, as for body weight exercises, remember, I say it again, squat, split leg, hinge, push, pull, um, bracing, anti-rotation, rotation. If you have that in your program and you can do it properly, then that will really benefit you in every way. So thank you, Leandi, and a big thank you to all the participants for attending today's session. We hope you enjoyed it and we look forward to seeing you back with us next Friday, which is the 30th of July at 4 p.m. for our next webinar, Building Sporting Confidence, presented by Metli Bhuptani, Lead Sport and Exercise Psychologist at Sir H. N. Reliance Foundation Hospital. Also, to facilitate responses to unanswered questions at our sessions today, and our previous sessions, we will be hosting a Q&A session on 28 July that is coming Wednesday at 4 p.m. again. At these Q&As, uh, participants will get a chance to ask questions directly to the experts who hosted the sessions at the RFIS Athletics Development Series. To attend the Q&A series of webinars, part of participants will need to register separately. We will be sending out a new registration link for the Q&A session to be held out on Wednesday. Uh, 28 July at 4 p.m. again. So do make sure you register by the 27th of July to be able to tune in. Before you leave the session, we kindly request you to fill out the feedback form that you'll be able to see at the end of the session. On behalf of the entire RFIS family, thank you once again. We hope you all have a great weekend ahead. Come on, India, let's play. And a big thank you, Leandi.